Good morning. I presume this is on, yeah. I don't worry about microphones quite so much. I do need to worry about that. <laughs> Those of you who know me will know I tend to wander, so I'm going to try and make sure I stay somewhere where the camera sees me. For those of you who know me, it's lovely to see you all again. For those who don't, I'm Tony Mays. I was a deacon and an elder at Gateway Baptist Church and then um, a minister at Harlow Baptist Church until nearly two years ago when I retired. And I now live in Angering and uh, have lots of time for my family finally, <laughs> which is quite fun. I spent yesterday afternoon with my daughter and her da one of her daughters, my wife, our dogs, on the beach in, Rus in uh, Goring, letting the dogs run in the water. And well, I have a Cocker Spaniel, by the way. He's mad, totally mad, but loves the sea. So he goes straight in and swims. The waves roll him over, and he comes back out, goes back in again. <laughs> Eventually, I give him some food, and he comes home, and we can put his lead back on. So we've got him trained that far. <laughs> so... Our passage. Well, I'm not going to read through and expose the passage scripture by scripture. I'm going to use it as a bit of a springboard. I understand. Let's put the slide up. There we are. I understand. Oh, what's that called? No, that's the wrong one. That's gone the wrong way, hasn't it? Ah, that's it. I understand that you've been starting a series on lifting Jesus up. You know, we have that song, don't we? about lifting Jesus high. And we often sing it in church. And it reminds us that our worship is important no matter whether we're together like this or whether we are out there on our own or with our family, with our friends, with our golf club or in the pub or wherever it is that we go. But I suspect if I were to ask each of you, what does it mean to lift Jesus up? each of you would give me a slightly different answer that would vary according to who we are, our experiences, and perhaps what we feel confident about in our lives and in our social lives. You might be thinking, well, maybe it's about prayer. Maybe it's about preaching. Maybe it's about teaching or evangelism or whatever. There's lots of examples in Scripture of lifting Jesus up. Do you know one of my favourite characters in the Bible, and I've actually led church weekends on him, is Nehemiah. There's so much in Nehemiah. And he starts by lifting God up in prayer, on his knees, surrendering everything to what God's purposes are. And sometimes I think, Unlike Nehemiah, we make our purposes God's purposes. And actually, we need to get back to basics. What does God want? Not what do I want, what does our church want, but what does God want of me? Because when we find more of that in our lives, we will, as church, find more of God in our church lives and in our communities. And that's kind of where I'm going to go, a little bit of who are we how do we individually lift Jesus up in our lives? So, I'm going the wrong way again. There we go, that way. I was reading recently um, in a book. Um, I tend to have a book on the go all of the time, as well as my Bible. And there's a commentator, a guy called Brennan Manning. He makes this point the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians, folks like us, who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out of the door and deny him with their lifestyle. Now, we can all think that's not me. But actually, to a degree, it is me, it is you. There are always challenges in life where perhaps we fall over a little bit in showing Jesus in our lives. And what I want to look at a little bit is how Peter's words in this passage can help us to understand what it means to lift Jesus up in our lives. So, first of all, we're going to look at some spiritual food. Peter starts this section with a real cry 
He cries out an exultation. Desire the word. Lay aside everything that will pollute our lives. And he gives some pretty harsh examples, but he says, I want you to crave, absolutely want spiritual food. Now, if you know the King James Version of the Bible at all, there's some really interesting things in there sometimes in the translations. And I noted that in that one, it actually mentions specifically the word. It draws our attention to the word. And that's not talking about specifically the Bible. It's talking about Jesus, the word of God shown through Christ. Crave the spiritual food that Christ offers us, gives us. 1 Peter 1.23 says this. I'm going to get this right in a minute. For you have been born. This is the passage before, and this is what leads into this one. You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Peter's building his case. And you often find this in the letters in the Bible. The writer builds their case. He's saying, think of Jesus. Crave Christ in your life. Crave what Jesus brings to your life. It will transform and change you. Peter's calling on his reader to desire something other than what the world would have us desire. And again, if I were to ask you all the things that are possibly on your heart that you would love more than anything, there would be a different range of things. And I know if, if I were to be honest, there's probably things I have in my heart. I bought a, a new, not so new, but newer car recently because my poor old Land Rover finally gave up on me. Um, and I had, it was 15 years old and finally costing so much money that um, I had to let it go, and I loved it. It was a lovely machine to drive, um, built solidly. Um, so we had to buy a, new, a newer, not-so-new car. Um, now, I love cars. My wife has a different view of cars. Nicola, um, some of you will know, her view of car is you get in it, you turn the key, it's got four wheels and a steering wheel, and it goes where you want it to go. I'm thinking, what does it do? How fast does it go? How well does it change gear? How reliable is it? We have different desires for that vehicle. And I think in our spiritual lives, we can have different desires as well. And we sometimes look at somebody else's desire and think, oh, that's not for me. And they look at us and think, oh, no, that's not for me either. Sometimes when we're out in the world around us, which we are, let's face it, we spend an hour or two in church on Sunday morning and the rest of our week, we are in the world. And I see no separation between what we call the spiritual and the secular. I don't see a separation. I don't think there is a secular world. It's a strange word that we've coined. We live in a spiritual world all of the time, 24-7. And who we are in it makes a difference. And that's where Peter's getting us to. You see, too often, we can dumb down what it means to be a Christian because we think it makes us more acceptable. I would challenge that view. I think we're more acceptable when we're honest about who we are and what we believe. And we stand firm on it. And so Peter's telling us, Engage in this spiritual life. Know who you are in Christ. Walk with Christ. Take it with you into everything. The decisions that we're making, the choices that we make, the things that we do. Again, if you know me reasonably well, you'll know that I quite like a beer. Not too much, but I like a beer. One of the things that uh, I found in Harlow quite a lot was that there were a lot of folks around the church who didn't come to church, but you could find them in the pub. And so Nick and I would go into the pub probably once a week, once every two weeks, and we would stand at the bar and I would have a beer. Nicola very seldom drinks, so she would just have a soft drink. And 
the number of people who came up to talk to us because they knew who we were and even corrected others when they swore in front of us. Not that it bothered me that people swear. They're not, if they're not Christians, I don't expect them to worry about their language too much. But they would correct others at the bar who swore when we were there. We had an impact. You guys all have an impact if you want to have it on all of those that you come into contact with because of the spiritual life that is within you. Where does that lead us? Well, if we go to the book of Philippians, it tells us this. So that you may become blameless and pure. That's what this spiritual life is about. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them, the people of which we associate with, like the stars in the sky, and you as you hold firmly to the word of life, to Christ. Just think on that for a moment. Shining like stars in the sky. People notice Christians who are truthful to what they believe. And we make a difference. Because we care, because we love. Because we follow what Christ asks of us. In whatever situation. Sometimes to great cost. So Peter, going back to verse 1, tells us, put aside the stuff that gets in the way. Put aside the maliciousness, the hypocritical behavior, the enviousness. Put aside gossiping and slandering. They may be the things that others do. They should not be the things that we do. And then later on in verse 11, he kind of crowns that with a bit more. And he says, put away sinful desires. The things that would blemish, if you like, our spiritual journey with Christ. And again, let's not understand that we're perfect. None of us are, neither me nor you. But we can always improve if we allow Christ through the work of his spirit to go on transforming us day upon day upon day. So where does that lead us? Crave that pure spiritual food which is from Christ, which is for all of us, without exception. There are no special cases in the Christian world. We are all called to be his children, his sisters and brothers, filled with his spirit, so let's crave that pure spiritual food that comes from Christ and by being transformed into his likeness. Well, that leads me to the next bit, living, living in that light. Peter in this passage talks about light quite a lot. Now, if we go back a bit, Jesus' words in Luke, Jesus tells us that there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, nothing concealed that will not be known or brought into the open. And so, when we lift Jesus up in our lives, we need to remember we are meant to be children of light. Of light. light shines. It opens up in the darkness. We're in the process of having our house renovated a bit at the moment, and we've just had a room built on the back of the bungalow, which means that one of the rooms that was a bedroom stroke my office is now considerably darker because there's this room on the other side of it. I turn the light on, and it's light. One light makes all the difference. Each of you is one light. You make all the difference because you are light. And we are meant to be light. We're called to be light. And that's what Peter is telling us. You see, God knows everything about us. He knows about all of our decisions. He knows about all of our heart attitudes. He knows why we do what we do when we do right things, when we do wrong things. We don't hide it. We might think we can hide it because human beings are really good at convincing themselves that God won't know that bit, will he? But actually, God does. God knows everything about us and everything we do. 
And he wants us to go on being changed, to recognize when we get stuff wrong and get it right. Nothing is hidden. And so living as children of light means literally that, living as light in our communities, in our, in our families. There's a lovely thought that your two granddaughters going to university and because of the impact of grandparents, parents, church, and then Christians at university touching base with them. There's a continuation. We're part of a whole. We're not an isolated little enclave in Shedding Dean here and nothing else is going on. We are part of a whole. The church is everywhere. And there are many wonderful points of light all over. Paul, Peter also tells us that we're meant to be living stones. Now that seems a bit heavy, doesn't it? If you're like me and you pick up stones in the garden, they do weigh a fair bit. And we've got quite a few stones in our garden. Um, having been built on flint, um, takes a lot of digging. But Paul is talking about, Peter is talking about something really quite different. Can you imagine a living stone, a stone that isn't fixed in shape, size or weight? but fits together with other stones and possibly changes shape as those stones are all fitted together. And Peter is saying, you are part of something big, something amazing, and you're all meant to fit together. As you live as children of light, you will become a spiritual household. And that spiritual household starts in each one of us, grows through our fellowship in church, but we are, again, part of that wider spiritual household that spreads across the world. All those little points of light, all coming together. I don't know if any of you have seen fireflies at work. You see one firefly, and it's one little thing zizzing around in the dark. And then suddenly there's two and three and four and five and six, and suddenly there's a host of them. And there's light all around. That's us. Fireflies, light. Light in a community that needs to see it, in a world that needs to see it. Meshed together to become those who lift up Jesus with our lives to others. And it's through us that others see Jesus. You know, in evangelistic terms, we, we, we sometimes tend to hark back to the big tent meetings and the massive gatherings Percentage-wise, very few people ever actually became disciples through them in all the, st the statistics that have been put together. The most effective disciple-making mechanism is you and me. Meeting with others, talking with them, showing what it is to believe what we believe and the impact it has. I recall some years ago reading about a Baptist minister in the USA and I, I tell you this story because I think it shows something of what Peter's telling us about being living stones. Now, this minister was called to a church in the southern states of the USA. And he discovered, having got there, that they were on the edge of, uh, they were in what they call downtown, town center. And the downtown where he was was on the corner of the red light district. So you can imagine that evening activity was quite um, interesting and there were a lot of interesting people about he, with some others praying, felt God call them to reach out to that red light district. Now, you can imagine, nice, strict Baptist church, you know, everyone doing the right things and being nice and dressing well and all the rest of it. And the pastor starts seeing young women coming in on Sunday morning who wouldn't come through the front door because they were too embarrassed. They came in through the vestry door and sat at the side. But they were in their working clothes. And you can imagine what they looked like. The pastor took flack galore. People said, you should be leaving this church. You're not the right person for us. You need to, to not do this. We don't want to see this. We don't want our children to see these people. One of them, an elder lady, was very, very vocal about all of this. And the pastor was getting quite worried because she was very much a stalwart of the church. People listened to her. And he sent them away to pray before the church meeting. The church meeting was held. After a lot of up and down and arguing and whatever else, 
this particular lady stood up and said, I guess we just have to learn to love them. And that's what they did. And they began transforming an area of the town that probably most Christians wouldn't think about going to. Transforming it with the love of Christ. Being light in that place and bringing those people in to become living stones in their own right. See, God doesn't mind what we dress like or what our past is. God can transform any person to be a living stone, to be light. And so, where do we go with living it out? We need to learn to love others. Not because we want them to be something different, but we love them for who they are. Christ loves us as we are. He loved us as we were, even though we've probably all changed a bit in the, under his influence. Meeting with others like this. In Hebrews it tells us, doesn't it, don't get away from fellowshipping with other Christians. How often have we heard that expression? I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. I don't need any of that stuff. I don't believe it. When we have a heart for Christ, we want to be with other Christians, if we possibly can. Being accountable to each other. Admitting who we are. The stuff we get wrong, the stuff we get right. Being open, nothing hidden. Put Jesus first in our lives. When he's first, we will get more right than wrong. And so, bringing all this to a, to a conclusion, if you like, the key is that as living stones, as light in our community, we are meant to be seen. We should not hide what we believe. We accept that we're imperfect. We accept that we fail. That lovely word, repentance, which so often is hard. And most mornings I spend a bit of time in prayer, or quite a lot of time in prayer, and part of my prayer every morning is, Lord, show me what I got wrong. Help me to see if I've made mistakes and show me how to do better. Because I accept, I'm human, I get stuff wrong. I have attitudes that are wrong, I have ways of doing things that are wrong. I want God to change me, to go on changing me. Because he has, and I know that he has, and I know that he will. We need to know that the Holy Spirit will work through us. Has done, is, and will, as we shine as lights in the community. As we set aside the stuff that clutters our lives that doesn't need to be there. And become more molded as living stones, as light in the darkness. And so the world gets to see us. <coughs> gets to see what is important in our lives and why. It makes a difference. My wife and I started going to church, not because of an evangelist, not because um, somebody said you need to go to church or need to take the children to get christened or something like that. We started going to church because we moved to a place up in Hertfordshire when I was a lot younger, and Nicola was pregnant, and we had neighbours who, it turned out, were Christians, but they never actually told us that, not for quite a long time. And they helped us tremendously when Sarah, our first, was born, and Nicola was very ill um, and continued to be ill for quite a long time. They were just there. Didn't matter what it was, they were there. In fact, Keith, who is still very good friends with us, and June, Keith helped me take the engine out of my car when it failed, and we stripped a car down and put it back together because it needed a new gearbox. How many friends do that? <laughs> and it was in his garage because mine wasn't big enough. As a result of all their friendship, we asked them why one day. Why, why are you so friendly? We've not seen people like this. And this is what we believe, that as Christians, we should help our neighbours. And so we, we said, well, we've not really come across this in a big way. Nicola was brought up in a church background. I wasn't. And, and I'm an inquirer. 
I analyze, I have to look at things. And I said, why? So we started going to a Bible study group with them who were very tolerant of me and my questions. And as a result, started going to church. And it was a journey that took some years before we were able to commit our lives to Christ. But it started with the friendship of those two points of light who were our neighbors. Every one of you has neighbors. No matter where you live, you have neighbors. You have family. You can be those points of light. Being seen is absolutely of the highest importance. Being seen to be who we are. Not perfect, but Christians doing the best we can. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So let's be those living stones and those lights. Let's lift Jesus up in everything we do. Amen.